I want to go to the fourth part of the series, preaching series that we started four weeks or really five weeks ago, um, and it's entitled Facts About Faith. Facts About Faith. We have been looking at the various areas and aspects of what it really means to believe and to trust in God. And yet at the same token, there are things that God does in our lives that go ignored and we don't even recognize on a daily basis. It reminds me of the story of a man and he loved to hunt, especially duck hunting, and he had two of his best friends that he always hunt with. And, and the season was coming up and this man just wanted to go all out to impress his friends. So he spent a couple thousand dollars on this duck retrieving dog. That's the dog that, that goes out and gets the duck after you shoot it on the water and bring it back to the boat. And so after spending all of this money on this, this dog, he, he went out to impress his, his friends on the first day of their hunting trip, duck hunting trip. Now what you need to know about this dog is the dog has been trained and groomed to walk on water. So he's not an ordinary dog. And so the first hunter shot a duck and the duck falls into, in the water. And the man, he says to the dog, you know, go get it. And he just starts skipping and running across the top of the water, retrieves the duck, bring him back to the boat. The guys didn't look impressed at all. They shot the next duck. The man said, go get him. And he ran out to go get the dog to skip and run it on top of the water. He's come flying back, jumps in the boat with the duck in his mouth. They did this all day long. Shoot a duck, duck falls to the water, dog runs out, running on top of the water, skipping back, bring the, the duck back to the boat. So then the man said to his buddies with a smile on his face like, hey, did y'all notice anything unusual or extraordinary about my dog? One man looked at him and said, the dumb dog can't even swim. Sometimes we miss the extraordinary because we're so focused on the ordinary. And let me say it another way. Sometimes we miss the supernatural because we're so focused on the natural. Sometimes, let me say it another way, we miss the unlimited power of a glorious God because we glory in the limited power of sinful men. We're so focused on the norm that we miss, if you will, God at work. I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 14 this morning. Again, as we continue to talk about faith, what it means to trust in God from a biblical perspective. Matthew chapter 14 and begin reading at verse 22 that is a, is a passage in a section of scripture that many of you are familiar with this narrative, this storyline. But I want us to get reacquainted. And for some of you, I want to introduce you to some truths in here that we may not have treasured in the past. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he, Jesus, was left alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind, Matthew says, was contrary. He ought to know because he was on that boat. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, went to the disciples, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them. He spoke to them. He used, listen to this carefully, the word of God to speak to them in their trouble. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in a storm. Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus simply said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was bolsterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to Peter, O ye of little faith, 
Why do you doubt? And when they had gotten into the boat, the wind ceased. Notice the wind ceased after they got into the boat. Then those who were in the boat, underline this, this is the key to the passage, came and worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Uh, if I could tag this text this morning, I would like to use the title, Stepping Out on Jesus. Can you say that with me? Yeah. Stepping Out on Jesus. God has created laws in the universe. These are natural laws, we call them. They can be tested by science itself. Again, these are his laws that he has established. They're the laws of nature. But in the supernatural, listen to me carefully, in the supernatural, God can break his own laws that he's established regarding na uh, nature. In other words, to accomplish his perfect will, God will break his own laws of the natural to perform the supernatural for his divine purposes. In this text, the law of nature that God has established regarding water is such as a man is not capable of just walking on water. That's not natural. The natural, it breaks, if you will, and goes against the grains of nature. But yet at the same token, God himself, Christ, walked on the water. He broke his own rules to establish his purpose. Man can't break the laws of God, the nature, the natural laws of God, without consequences. In other words, you can't go on top of a building and just jump off and expect to fly. Because in, in science, there is the law of gravity. And we have to adhere to that law or there are severe consequences. The natural law that God has established is irrefutable regarding death. When a person dies, another person cannot, I'm talking about dead dead, they cannot bring them back to life because it is a natural law. When a human dies, then that human is dead until God breaks his own law of nature and performs the supernatural to accomplish his purpose. I wish I had a church that knew what I was talking about. So therefore, there's, this is God gives us another great reason why we ought to trust him, why we ought to put our faith and confidence in him. Here's the reason why. It's because God and God alone has absolute power over everything. And I mean everything. Everything. Including the laws that he's established in nature. So therefore, church, we don't use our natural eyes to see the supernatural power of a supernatural God. We're called to use the eyes of faith and trust in God to accomplish his desired uh, purposes despite what our natural circumstances might look like. The writer of Hebrews again says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith in the substance itself gives us the evidence of what we cannot see with our natural eyes that exist in the natural world because of a supernatural God. When we look at the historical context of Matthew chapter 14, Matthew opens up this 14th chapter with this this. Uh, this moment of climax where he rolls back the curtains to the stage and we see John the Baptist, New Testament prophet, who is beheaded by Herod and his head is served on a platter. The prophetic words of this New Testament prophet, prophet John the Baptist, have now come to pass. I must decrease so that he can increase. And now the morning star, John, has now given way to the sun of glory and he's rising in his meridian luster so that the world might see him in his glory. And yet God, Jesus, is, he's getting his ministry stride on. I mean, he's in full gear now. Multitudes are now following him in epic, epic proportion. Uh, when you look at Jesus, he, he's so overwhelmed physically that momentarily he desires to get away from the crowd. 
But yet they, this, this prodigious crowd continues to press against him for another miracle, for another parable, another story. And yet even the same crowd that followed him, at least 5,000 men, Jesus performs another miracle and defies his laws of nature by performing the supernatural. He opens up a, a Captain D's in the middle of fish and chips in the middle of nowhere. And with just a, a two-piece snack and extra biscuits, he feeds 5,000. That's the way my Bible reads anyway. I don't know what translation you're reading from. Jesus has already gone against the laws of nature when we read through Matthew approaching this 14th chapter. He's already demonstrated his supernatural power over natural laws to establish his purpose. He's already turned H2O into a, 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 a fine wine. He has already healed two blind men. He has already forgiven a, a paralytic man and, and, and caused him now to stand up on his two feet and walk. He has already healed a group of men of a, a, a leprous disease. He's already stopped the hemorrhaging of a woman by her simply touching the hem of his garment. I wish I had some Sunday school folk in here. He's already raised a dead daughter to life and defy the laws of nature. Now we see Jesus in Matthew chapter 14 says, let me take it to another level. Watch me skip and walk across some water. When we read this story, we need to read it in parallel form. In other words, what I'm saying is we need to lay the first storm and Jesus' disciples in the ship alongside of this storm and Jesus' disciples in the ship because they're two different uh, uh, circumstances and two different stories. We notice something in the first and second story that they, they differentiate between the one between the other. First of all, in the first story, we see the disciples are in the boat caught in the storm, but Jesus is in the boat with them the first time. In the first story, we see the great fear of the disciples because of the great storm. Stay with me, church. In the first story, we, we see Jesus rebuking the wind and the sea simply by using his word and causing a calm to come. In the first story, in the first storm, we hear the disciples pondering on the, Jesus, the, the identity of Jesus and betwixt themselves, I like that old King James word, betwixt themselves, they are pondering the identity of Jesus and they ask this question amongst themselves, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey his voice? In the first storm, in the first storm, it, Jesus also rebukes all of the disciples because of their lack of faith and says to them, oh ye, all of them of little faith. But the second storm is different than the first storm. What we can see in the second storm is this, there is some progress in their faith. In the second storm, we see that Jesus is not on the boat with them when they are caught in the storm. Now, now, now maybe you've already started putting the pieces together to this puzzle. And the reason being why he was in the boat with them the first time in the first storm is because he needed to be in closer proximity because is this their first hurricane experience. But after he has been in the boat with them and given them confidence the first time, the second storm, Jesus, listen, is not in the boat, but he's on the water. Some of y'all are going to catch that in a minute. In other words, where Jesus was in close proximity in your first storm, when your second storm comes, he doesn't need to be that close. Here's the reason why. You ought to have enough confidence in him by now. <laughs> it's, it's so in the second storm, in the second boat, the second occurrence of the story, we notice not only Jesus is not in the boat, but, but Matthew doesn't draw attention to the disciples' fear of the storm like he did in the first. No, they're not afraid of the storm. What they're afraid of is this, this phantasm. They, what they see walking on the water towards them is what looks like a ghost. They're not afraid of the storm anymore. God's got that. They're assured of that. But what they are afraid of is this apprehension, this, 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 this ghost-looking figure coming on the water. This is where we say it today in the South. They saw a hank. I can imagine them asking each other, is that your uncle? No, that ain't. 
Is that, is that your grandfather? No, that ain't my granddaddy. Well, who is this? Because the idea is somebody that has come from the dead, listen, and from the dead of wickedness that have come back to destroy them. That was the idea in the culture. And so Jesus is walking towards them, but it was no ghost in the storm. It was Jesus in the storm. We, we got to commend the disciples because they've, they've grown in their faith to some degree where they're not afraid of the storm. But the problem is they can't recognize Christ now in the storm. Let, let me ask you a question, Body of Christ Church. Can you see Jesus in the middle of your storm? Christ has a way of disguising himself, concealing himself in our storms in life. We look everywhere else except in the eye of the storm. Every storm that happens in our life is created by God himself. In the natural, in the emotional, in the physical, no matter what it is, in the social, it is created by God himself so that he can make his appearance in the storm. The question is, can you see him? And do you fear the storm more than you can see Christ in the storm? God always has transition with purpose. Somebody say transition with purpose. But when we look at this text, there, there's, there's a, a transition, but there's a purpose in the transition. I don't want you to miss this in the text and other passages as well. We can find this and we sort of skip over this. But Jesus says to his disciples on this side, I want you to get in the boat and go to the other side. Now that sounds simple. Jesus says to his disciples on this side, I want you to get in the boat so we can go to the other side. Jesus always has a destination and purpose in mind when he tells you something. He's not saying it for the sake of saying it. It, it, it. And the things that happen to us in life, they're not by accident, by chance, or by luck, or by circumstances that's non-existent. They happen because of the predetermined, the predetermined purpose and plan of a sovereign God. Notice Jesus tells the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side. But the language that he, Matthew records that Jesus used, he said, and he made them get into the boat. He compelled them to get in the boat. He forced them to get. You better get your tail in this boat. Here's the reason why. Because they were comfortable where they were on this side. But God wanted them to go to the other side. Here's the reason why, because where they were was not where he intended for them to be. Where he, they were today is not where he intended for them to be on tomorrow. Somebody getting the spiritual principle already. In other words, on this side was good for today and the past, but on this side it's not good for tomorrow and the future. Uh, let me say it another way. My brothers and my sisters, do you understand that where you are now, God does not want you to be in this place a year from now, three years from now, five years or 10 years from now. Uh, Y'all getting this now? Uh, where you are now may be good for now, but God wants you to go to the other side. But we don't want to go to the other side. Most folk would rather stay right where they are. Here's the reason why, because we're comfortable on this side. And we understand that, that it, we're gonna have to be challenged and that challenge is gonna bring about change and nobody really likes change. But if you want new gains, you gotta have new gains on new grounds. Where you are now is not where God intends for you to stay. But here's what I noticed. Even folks that are miserable, they don't mind being miserable on this side. They're comfortably uncomfortable in their misery. I would rather stay on this side because I don't really know what's on the other side. But in order to be transformed into the image of Christ, you've got to go to the other side. Going to the other side is really not the problem, church. That's really not the greatest challenge we have. 
No, because if I could just get into a jet or get into some time capsule and be forwarded to the other side, if I could just be forwarded and be transformed to the image of Christ instantly, I wouldn't mind that at all. Well, the reason why I don't want to go to the other side and leave this side to go to the other side is because I am afraid to cross over the sea of uncertainty. So I would rather stay where I am. I have a present comfort, but what it does is it hinders my future conversion. My present comfort hinders, that's a tweetable moment, y'all ain't tweeting right now, my future conversion. That's the reason why we say stuff that's so non-biblical. It is anti-Christ and anti-Christian. Can I share just a few of those things with you? We really don't want to cross over to the other side. We can talk about heaven all day, being with Jesus, crystal seas, no more tears, no more sorrow. I'm gonna see my mom and my loved ones on the other side, but don't nobody wanna go to the other side. So we say things that are unbiblical and anti-Christ. We say things like to each other, how you doing, bro? Man, I'm doing good. Well, it's good to see you, man. It's better to be seen than to be viewed. Because if you're viewed, you're dead, right? So people say it's better to be seen, to be alive, than it is to be dead. But it's antichrist. It's unbiblical. Because Paul the apostle himself said, to live is Christ, but to be viewed is gain. Y'all didn't catch that. Uh, Paul himself said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what we're saying is, I'd rather stay on this side where I'm comfortable. What I know that I'm gonna be faced with, but I really, in reality, we still don't know what tomorrow holds. In other words, we're afraid, listen, I'm not going to heaven, I'm afraid of that sea between here and heaven that I gotta cross that is tumultuous, that is filled with physical death. But Paul says we have this confidence. He says even more over or more so, he said, I would rather be absent from the body. We've got this confidence. And second thing, he said, but I would even rather to leave here and to go to the other side. Hey, I don't see folk packing up. No, no, we ain't taking down the pegs from this tent. It's because we're afraid of the other side. But it's a principle as well. Now sometimes when I use that kind of language, it sounds morbid to some folk. They say, it sounds like he's praising death. No, I'm praising the God of life. But you, can't, you cannot enter into everlasting life, eternal life, not unless you're willing to cross the threshold of death. And for the believer, God has given us this insurance through Christ Jesus that those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, we have already passed from death unto life. But yet when we talk about staying on this side, most pastors and church and church members, I've noticed we'd rather continue to do things the same old way and get the same old results on this side regarding ministry. And listen, not only that, but do it with the same old folk without evangelizing and leading other new people to Christ. We'd rather use the same old recycled sermons and the same old remixed songs with the same old testimonies that are unchanged because our lives are unchanged with the same old lifestyle and the same old undeveloped faith. Here's the reason why we're comfortable on this side. Why? It's because we would rather recycle the same experiences over and over and over again instead of trusting God for new experiences that will take us further uh, in Christ and to become more like Christ and it's through transformation. We like being on this side. I, let me say this, come here for a second. Y'all ain't coming, I said come here for a second. <laughs> let, let me say this, and I know that it's biblically correct. I'm not, not, not saying that overconfidently or pridefully, but I know that it's biblically correct. It is theologically correct what I'm about to say, but it goes against the grains of the norm of what we feel and what we've heard. Listen to me carefully. 
Even when we think about what we pray for, we pray safe prayers. We pray this side prayers. We pray prayers of comfort. We don't pray prayers of trust. Even when we leave the church, churches all across the world will say, Lord, as we leave this place, give us traveling mercy. Please don't let any hurt, harm, or danger come to us. So let me reverse it. If hurt, harm, or danger, even death comes to it, who do you think brings it about? Who do you think arranges it? If God is sovereign, then he has absolute control over it. Some of y'all don't like that, but you got to refute it based on the scriptures and not what you think. God either has absolute control or he doesn't have any control. God is not allowing Satan to do something and then scratch his head and say, I know you were going to do that, so now I got to figure out what I'm going to do in response. The word of God says when calamity come, who's caused it? God brought the calamity to the city. Job said, should we expect only good from God, he says to his wife, and not just evil from God, from God. We pray safe prayers. Lord, as I board this plane, don't let this plane crash. We pray safe prayer, prayers. That's the reason why ain't nobody packing up and doing missions overseas. Nobody's making any sacrifices. Let me say this, especially in our communities, because we pray safe prayers. Lord, keep me safe. Lord, I wanna, I wanna make sure I keep my job. Lord, I wanna get a promotion. Lord, watch. Is it wrong to pray those prayers? No, absolutely not. I think the best way is to pray, pray it is this way. Lord, here's the reality. I'm a sinner. I have taken the things that you have created them, it created and treasured them more than I have treasured you. So in reality, oh Father, in my petition, you owe me absolutely nothing. Because you, but yet you have saved me from eternal damnation by your grace and not by my merit. So God, if I could make this petition that I don't rightly deserve, I pray for safety. I pray for safe travel. I pray that you'll watch over my family. I pray that when I go into a doctor, I'll get a good report. But if not God, I know that you are sovereign. And I know that you have a will and a purpose that far exceeds my understanding and my feeble and weak plans. So therefore, God, give me grace and give me strength to trust you even in the uncertainties of the seas. Not safe prayers, prayers of faith. Jesus is Christ himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, God in flesh in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not my will, your will be done. You know, I've come to the conclusion that most folk never grow past their first two years of salvation. It's because they're comfortable on this side and they don't want to be challenged to get in the boat and cross over the other side. If you don't mind, they'll, they'll forgive you. Slap the person next to you and say, get in the boat, Annie Mae, get in the boat. <laughs> Not promoting violence from a movie or anything else. I'm just saying sometimes we need to be awakened, amen, from our slumber. Here, here's the next thing I want you to notice. Somebody say next thing. The scene takes place in the middle of the night in the middle of the sea. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the storm. The text says in the fourth watch, which is 3 a.m., in the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, and they're caught in the middle of a storm. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, and they're caught in the middle, in the eye of a storm. Has it appeared to you or occurred to you like with me that it seems like I'm always in the middle of something good when the bottom falls out? I'm always in the middle of something. In other words, life is going good. Man, I'm, out, I'm sailing the seas. I, the sun is shining, and then all of a sudden, the clouds roll in, and it gets dark. Okay, let me reverse it and say it another way. Have you ever started getting a little nervous, a little fearful when things start going really good in your life? 
Because you start thinking, oh, Lord, things going real good now. Got a job, got a promotion. Oh, God, things going. I lost a little weight. Oh, boy. And it, it think, we done bought a new house. You got a new car. You, you get, oh, God, things are just going well. And in the back of your mind, it's like, how long is this going to last? Because this is what we know. By the time we get in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, listen, we're going to get caught in the middle of the storm. But something good always comes out of it. Something good always comes out because God directs the time, he directs the ship, he directs all of nature around you. And so therefore a good God, good, good father will produce something good out of this. It is not in vain. It is not purposeless. He has a purpose for it. But then we always ask this question, the why. Why me, Lord? Why am I going through this storm? And the third why is, why now? Why me, Lord? Why am I going through this storm? Why this storm? And then why now? If I could start from the back and just, just, just the, the why now. Why now, Lord? Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all would schedule adversity on your calendars if God would allow you to do it? Yeah, I think, I think I'd be good somewhere right around the, uh, the 18th of July. Uh, no, I make that the 15th of February because uh, I got some other things to do. Uh, none of us would ever schedule a storm on our schedule. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? And so God has to schedule them for us. Here's the reason why, because we like it on this side. We like it safe. We don't want to get in the boat. We don't want to cross over to the other side. Why this? And then I'll try to answer the why this storm and then why me, Lord. Here's the simple way of asking it. It's because God knew that you were the only one who could go through this storm, this storm, because it's your storm. Tap your neighbor and say, I got my own storm, you get your own storm. See, see, God knows, listen very carefully, I don't care if you're married and sitting next to your spouse, you're dating whatever, your friends, who it might be in the sanctuary today. God knows that the road that he has designed for you, only you could travel that road because you're designed for it. He is equipping you for it. Now, in the natural, you will never make it down this road. But if you trust the God of the supernatural, he's designed this road, especially it is a designer road and path. Psalms 139, the psalmist says, and all of our days were recorded in his book. In other words, he's already laid it all out specifically for you. This is your journey. This is not anyone else's journey. He knew that the disciples, that, that they, were, they were made for this. They were made, not the rest of the folk, but they were made for this. Let me give you a, a parallel, a parallel. In Matthew chapter 25, parallel principle, there's this parable that Jesus tells and he says that a kingdom of God is like a man, he had servants and he called three of his servants because he was about to go on a journey. Y'all remember that? And he gave to these men his talents. Talents could be referred to as money or we, I like to refer to it as resources. He gave, he entrusted them his resources and said to them, hey, I'm going away and I come back. And the goal was, whatever I have given you, I expect you to utilize as a wise steward and to invest it and it'll be more when I come back. So he gave to one man five talents. He gave to another man two talents. And he gave to the third man one talent. Listen to this. But the text says, he gave to each one of them based on their ability. Based on their ability. Their God-given, God-designed ability because he knew that the man that he gave five talents to could handle five talents if he was willing to trust, listen to this, and value the master. The man who he had given two talents, he wouldn't give him three, four, or five is because he knew that that would be too much for him. God has not given him the ability to utilize those two talents. The, one, the, the well, last guy that he gave, the one talent, knew that that was all that that man would ever be able to handle, even in trusting in the master. But yet the one man played it safe, and he buried it. And this is what he said, I knew 
I buried it because you were a hard taskmaster. And you were asking me for something that you didn't rightly deserve. You didn't deserve an investment. And so what he did was not only have faith and not have faith and confidence in his master, but he didn't value and treasure his master. He had fear, but he didn't prize his master. Here's another way of saying it. He feared him, but he didn't love him. But he gave to each one based on their ability. God, the storm that you're going through, listen, God has created this storm, designed this storm, that you would go through it. Here's the reason why. Because he knows that if you trust him, you not only make it through it, but you are living your God-given purpose that he's preparing you for. Because what the, the purpose of the storm, the purpose of going from this side to that side, they were going to Gennesaret for ministry. And you can't do ministry on this level, not unless, listen to this, you're willing to trust him in the storm. And so God called these disciples, but notice he told them to get into the boat. But he didn't tell, he didn't tell uh, uh, the, 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 the multitude of the 5,000 that he had just fed. He didn't ask not one of them to get into the boat. He didn't ask the paralytic man that he healed to get in the boat. He didn't ask the girl that he raised from the dead to get into the boat. No, he didn't ask one of the ten, either of the ten lepers to get into the boat. He said to these twelve, y'all get in the boat. This is your journey. It's a designer journey. And there's a reason why only one out of the twelve, listen carefully, a dude by the name of Pete stepped out of the boat and was willing to trust God to walk on water. Here's the reason why. This is the same Peter that God will give amongst the 12, divine revelation and insight of who Jesus really is as the Christos and the Messiah and also give him the keys to the kingdom. And so God will have to build your faith and your confidence and your trust in him in order for you to do what he's called you to do. You know what I found out? A lot of folk want the keys to the kingdom, but not everybody wants to walk through the threshold and cross that doorway and enter that journey. A, a, lot, a lot of folk, they, they wanna do big ministry, but they don't wanna bear big misery. Everybody, you know, everybody think they can pastor a church. I mean, every, I mean, especially, I don't say this in a derogatory way, you know, ministers everywhere, they think, you know, I can do this and I can do that. No, 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 no. You, the question, I don't even think you wanna do it. Everybody want big ministry, but you don't want big misery. Like, the reality is that everybody, they want your testimony, but they don't want any of your tests. They, they don't even understand what you're going through. They want your mission, but they don't want your mess. They want your blessing, but they don't want your bruising, and they don't want to bear your burdens. They want your trophies, but they don't want your trials. They want your good days and your good stuff, but they don't even understand what your bad days look like. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, said, you got a storm too. God designed a storm for you. You got to design a storm. There's something that God desires to do specifically in your life, and you were called specifically for this purpose. You're probably doing it every day, every small step of the way. But notice this. But God is going to go with you through this storm. He may not be in the boat, but I guarantee you, he's on the waters. But listen to this. Look behind you and say, it happens to the best of them. You talking to science, bro? <laughs> you talking to signs makes me wonder. Yeah. I, I want you to notice this because we got some bad theology floating around. Jesus says to his disciples, get in the boat, go to the other side. Knowing that he's going to create a storm. Get in the boat, go to the other side. Get in the boat, go to the other side. They obeyed Christ. They obeyed God's word. Got in the boat to go to the other side. And they were caught in a storm. Stop thinking when bad stuff happens to you that something is wrong. Because typically what happens is we say, God, I've been obeying you. I've been trusting you. I've been serving, I've been giving, I've been loving, and I don't understand why this is happening to me. It happens to the best of them. 
is because we think that if I live righteously, I can live safely and be exempt from storms. But that means you'll be stuck where you are and will never ever grow and be transformed to the image of God. Some of y'all ain't getting this, but you, you, you gotta understand that, that, that it happens to the best of them for a reason, for a purpose. They, they obey Christ and in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, they're caught in the middle of this storm. Yes, it happens to Christians, but especially to Christians, is because God wants to transform them. It's called progressive sanctification. Doctrinally, it's called progressive sanctification where daily and throughout the seasons of our life, God is sanctifying, has separated us for his purpose, for his use, for his love, for his grace, for this intimacy with him, and he's moving us right along with him. Progressive sanctification until we're finally, finally transformed to the image of Christ when we see Jesus face to face. But there's another reason. He not only uses these stones for our development and for our transformation, but so that we will learn to trust him. Remember what faith is. Faith is trusting in the integrity of God. A lack of faith says, I don't trust in the integrity of God. If God says, believe in me and you can trust me, no matter what your circumstances look like, no matter what the laws of nature look like, the natural. If God says, you can trust me, listen to this, then it's based on our faith is, and our confidence in him is based solely on his integrity. And his integrity asks these questions, three questions. Number one, is God really who he says that he is? Number two, can God do what he says that he can do? And number three, if those first two are in place, then the third question is this, do I tre therefore treasure him above all earthly treasures? Because, listen this very carefully, if I don't trust God, I'm calling him a liar. I know that's putting it point blank, and there's seasons in my life and all of our lives where it's like, ah, Lord, let me handle this one first. And if it don't work, then I'll come to you. That's not trusting him. What it's really saying is, I really trust in myself more than I trust in you. If it breaks down, then I'll come to you. And then when it works, I pat myself on the back and pop my collar. Because if he is who he says that he is, then we can trust him. But if I don't trust them, what I'm really saying is, you're really not who you say that you are. And you really can't do what you say that you can do. And so therefore, I have no reason to prize you because you're a liar, you're fake, and you're a fraud. So, what God is, is doing, he's building our confidence, our faith in him, our trust in him. I'm almost done, just hang on. Can I say just a couple more things? All right, God bless all seven and a half of y'all. <laughs> when I talk about faith and confidence in God, listen to this. I'm not talking about no Pollyanna faith. I'm not talking about puff billows of smoke that, that overshadow and speak away, if you will, the reality and the existence of the storms that occur in our lives on a daily basis. No, I ain't talking about that kind of faith. I ain't talking about no name it and claim it faith. No, no blab it and grab it, believe it and receive it. If you can just think it and if you can just speak it, then you speak away and think away your problems in Jesus name. Just attach his name to whatever it is you want or you don't want. Bind it. No, 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 no. I'm not preaching it. Listen, a prosperity gospel. I'm preaching an adversity gospel. How do I get through difficult times and in those difficult times, not when I come out of it, but before I get to it and when I'm in it, that I learn how to prize God above all. Not waiting on something else to happen. It's a miracle to be in the storm and to know that he's with me there versus just waiting to get out of the storm so he can deliver me. He delivers us for our development. He delivers us not for ourselves. Every miracle that God does in our life, every storm he ceases, and every water that he walks across to get to us, listen, ain't about us. It's about him. And him showing us just who he really is and we treasure him.
So I, I, I ain't trying to give you no fairy tale faith because we got to accept the existential realities of our daily lives and the troubles and sorrows that we have in life. There's a whole book in the Bible dedicated to that. It's the book of Job. <laughs> we talk about existential realities. Job had to face them. Job lost his family, he lost his servants, he lost his business, he lost, he lost everything. This, this, this book really is, God didn't exempt this book from, from, the, from his uh, uh, inspired uh, uh, writings. No, no, no. He put it there so that we'll know how to deal with the realities of loss and the realities of death and to understand that he's sovereign over death and he's sovereign, sovereign over all of our pains. It, it talks about not only our losses, but it talks about the faithfulness of God and whatever our adversity might be in this lifetime. Yet when we go back to Matthew chapter 14, Look at verse 26 and it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Be of good cheer. Immediately he gave them the word of God. I'm gonna go ahead and let you in on something now. How do I make it through my storms in life? The same way that the disciples made it. What did they hear? The word of God. It was spoken to them, but what was spoken to them is not just the word of God, be of good cheer, but he gave them a reason why they ought to be cheerful in the midst of their storm, why they ought to have joy in the midst of their storm. Here's the reason why, because I am God. It is I. It is I. <laughs> I'm not a ghost. It is I. Yet at the same token, we ask ourselves, is the word of God really sufficient enough? Or do I need something else? God has a way of speaking into absolute chaos and nothingness and voidness, just like he did in the very beginning when he spoke into this chaotic world of nothingness. And when God spoke the word, ultimately Christ went to work. God spoke and said, let there be, and there was. God not only created something beautiful out of nothing, but he gave it life. God is doing the same thing today through his word. And so that his word in itself is totally sufficient. Christ says, listen, be of good cheer for it is I. There's no need for you to be afraid. There's no need for you to be afraid. But then Peter responded. I can see Peter sitting on the edge of the boat. Now you got to command Peter. This dude is willing to walk on water. Now, I got to be honest with you. I know I might be your pastor. And we could talk about faith all day long. But bro, man, we're not. Listen, listen. And he didn't just step and walk on the water. Don't forget, the storm didn't cease until they got back on the boat. So he's walking on water in a storm. I wouldn't even try it on a clear day on glassy seas. <laughs> Now I started to demonstrate that I could walk on water by putting a little water in a cup and throwing it up here and then walking on it. That's about the only water I'm going to walk on. But notice what Peter says. After hearing the word, after hearing, somebody say, after hearing the word of God. After he hears Jesus himself say, in the storm, put a smile on your face because it is I. Uh, there's no need to be afraid. Have joy. There's no need to be afraid because... It is me. It is definitely me. Listen to what Peter says. Listen, because this room is filled with Peters. I'm one of them. Lord, if it is you. <laughs> Did you hear that? He just said, it's me. Peter said, if it is you. So why we need to go back over this again? It, 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 it is I. Lord, if it is. First of all, he says, he addresses them as Lord. But then he asks, is it really you? Lord, if it is you, command me to come. You commanded me to get in the boat. Command me to walk on this water. Listen to me carefully. We got to be ever so careful not to put God to the test after his word has already come forth. You hear the word on Sunday morning, let's just, just start there since it was Sunday morning. You hear the word of God on Sunday morning and it's like, well, I need some signs of confirmation. No, we just need to align ourselves with the word of God. Some of us are stuck on this side because we're still looking for a sign. God, if this is your will, then let a lightning bolt. Nah. 
Now, 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 Lord, if it is you, if it is you, then I need you to do something. I need you to prove yourself. Stop trying to put God to the test. Because I'm going to tell you how dangerous it is, although Christ complied, it's called grace. Because we join in the company of doubters when we want to put God to the test. First of all, look at his resume. He doesn't need to do anything new. We just need to reflect on what he's already done. He doesn't have to prove himself. He's already proven himself as God. We don't have to question if it is the word of God. You're reading it for yourself. You hear it for yourself. What Peter was really doing, he was joining in company with the likes of Satan. Because Satan used these same words in the wilderness when Jesus was fasting for 40 days. Do you remember what Satan said? Same words of Peter. If you are the son of God, command these stones to be turned to bread. If you are, if you are, if you are the son of God, then, then, then listen, then, then, then throw yourself down from this mountain and come to a pinnacle and be safe. If you are, if you are, he puts himself alongside of the high priest when Jesus is standing before him and the high priest asked Jesus the question, uh, tell us if you are, if you are the Christ, the son of God. You didn't need to ask that question. He is the Christ. He puts himself alongside of the mockers at Calvary. You saved everybody else if you really are. If you really are the son of God, then come down off the cross and save yourself. Do you realize the test that you're putting God to? God doesn't tempt anyone to sin and neither can he be tempted. We just need to learn how to obey. I know it's a process. Some of y'all looking at me and like, I ain't ready for this sermon today. That's because we're on this side. It's okay. But maybe God is answering your why me, why now, and why this storm. You got to take great risk if you're going to trust in God. <laughs> If you're going to walk with God, you got to take great risks. But then the risk is really not a risk because he has absolute control. It seems like it's a risk to us. But Peter does something and he goes to a place that I don't think is anybody in this room really willing to go. And the, certain, the other disciples certainly weren't willing to go. And that is he gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the ground on the water and that's something that is not natural. Here's the reason why, because he trusted in the words and he trusted the God of the supernatural. God, Christ compelled Peter to come, get out of the boat. We need to learn how to trust God when it seems like all odds are against us. Learn how to get out of the boat. Now I said I wouldn't have got out of the boat and walked on that water, but there's a several boats I've had to get out of. Learn to trust God and walk on water. We all got our boat, we all have our storm, and we all have our water to walk on. How many know Peter, he did well for a while? We always do well for a while. We start off, he jumped out, and I can just see him going, oh, that's kind of nice right here, boy. Then all of a sudden, that salt water splashed up and hit him in the face, and the wind started pushing him, and Peter took his eyes off of Christ, and he focused on his circumstances, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. The text says immediately Jesus reached out, pulled him up out of the waters, and yet he rebuked him ever so lovingly. O oh, ye of little faith, why did you take your eyes off me? and start focusing on your circumstances. Why did you doubt? That's the answer to why did you doubt? Why did you take your eyes off of me and focus on yourself? Why did you put more trust in yourself and your circumstances? You ain't no water walker. I'm the one. I walked on the water first to show you that in me, you can do it if you're willing to trust me. I'll break my own natural laws, laws of nature, supernaturally, if you're willing to trust me. So no matter what it looks like, no matter what the natural circumstances look like. Jesus is there to rescue us. Amen? Amen. Now, as I close, he, 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 here's the real reason why the story was included in the Bible in the first place. This story is really not about Peter's faith. This story is really, really, it includes, but it's really not about spiritual transformation. This story is really not about how does a believer make it through adversity? It's not. The story is certainly not about 
how to walk on water. If you look at the last verse in this story, verse 33, that normally when we're reading and normally when it's preached, we stopped at verse 32. Here's the reason why. Jesus quieted the storm and we got on the boat and now everything in life is hokey-dory. The storm is over. But verse 33 says this, then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him. Then those who were in the boat, they came and worshiped him. Then those who were in the boat, they weren't worshiping him like this before because they didn't just worship him, but now they worshiped him knowing him before they said truly, that's the first word, certainly with assurance before they said, who is this man that even the winds and the sea obey him? But now they say, truly, you are the son of God. It's worship. They didn't have that in their first storm. But now they've come to this place and they worship him. What it's all about. God says the storm is designed to check your worship. Who do you value and treasure the most? Me or others? Me or safety? Me or the comforts, creature comforts that I have provided for you? Me, the giver, or the things that I give? This, 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 again, it's not about stepping out of faith, it, 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 but it, it includes that. We got to remember this, is that this really is about God. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I said a few weeks ago that the actual substance is God himself. It's not our faith. That's the reason why the sermon title is not step out on your faith. Because my faith and your faith is too futile to put trust in. God never intended us to trust our faith. My faith is fickle. I got to let you know, this is the dude who told God back in 1991, June of 91, I want to start this church and I'll give it six months. And if I don't see any progress in six months, I, I got confirmation that this is not what, we had the same amount of people in six months that we had the first six days that we started. But here we are 27 and a half years later. And it ain't because of my faith. It's because of a gracious and powerful supernatural God. Amen? We don't make our faith the object of our faith. We make God the center and the object of our faith for the objections, for the objectives that he has placed before us. God says the storm is designed to check your heart. Do you know me? Are you willing to trust me? And are you willing to prize me above all? Check your storms. You know, when we go to the doctor in closing, we don't feel good. We got aches and we got pains. We go to the doctor and we walk into the office and the doctor says, he or she says, what seems to be the problem? We say, my head hurts. I got a stomach ache or got this pain in my back. What we're doing is we're giving the doctor our symptoms head hurt, my stomach aches, my got a pain in my back. And the doctor starts going through process of elimination. They ask a few more questions. When you start having it, is it a scale of one to 10, how severe is the pain, all those other questions. He said, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna run some tests. My mama said, we're gonna run some tests on you. Cause it's gonna be more than one. We're gonna double plural this thing. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna do some lab work. We're gonna check the blood, your analysis. We're gonna find out what's going on inside your body. And then we're gonna do some x-rays and some scans to find out. You say, I got a headache. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, listen, you're talking about and describing what you feel. And the doctor says, but we're gonna to get to the root of why you feel this way. When you come to God by faith, we bring him our symptoms. God, my heart is broken. I have no purpose and no significance in life. I'm overwhelmed, I'm fearful, I've got anxiety. I, I'm angry all the time. Those are symptoms. I don't have any peace and, and, and Lord, this, that, and the other. And those are symptoms. Lord, I've been hurt, I've been offended. Why are you hurt? Why are you offended? Those are all symptoms. And God says, now the question is, are you willing to stand before my spiritual x-ray? 
You're going through the storm for a reason so that I can reveal to you what's at the root of your problem. Now the question is, are you gonna trust the true prescription? Or do you want what other churches are giving you a placebo? My mama used to call them a sugar pill. It's not real medicine, it's just something that you take and then psychologically it just makes you feel better. But it's, it's, it's nothing in it that would really deal with a real issue. It just makes you feel good. It's sugar water, swallow it, it's sweet and it tastes good. But it's really not dealing with the problem. Jesus ain't gonna give you a placebo, a false gospel, a sugar gospel. It's sweet, but it ain't fake. He says, listen, I'm gonna give you a real prescription. If you're gonna come to me, you gotta come to me willing to face the truth, be willing to face the truth. Because I am the way, I am the truth, and if you want this life, we're gonna have to deal with the truth. Now the reality is none of our faith is where it really should be. This is not about big faith, this is about taking small steps to trust in a big God. Why me, Lord? Because he knows that you were the only one could go through this and going, you're going through it for a purpose. Why now, Lord? Because there ain't never a convenient time to go through a storm. Why this storm? Because he's got something special for you, not just when you come out to the other side, but while you go through it, he'll teach you how to walk on water. Are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to step out on Jesus? Are you willing to step out on Jesus? Some of y'all, you're scared, to, you're scared to say yes. You don't have to say yes, you have to clap. You're scared to say yes, it's like, I ain't gonna say that because the bottom might fall out Wednesday. Let me tell you something, the bottom is gonna fall out whether you agree to it on Sunday or not. Just because I don't say it. Because some of us got this stuff in our head, it's bad theology again and terrible doctrine. Or I don't wanna speak things into existence. Stop all of that foolishness. What's wrong? It sounds like you got a cold. I ain't got no cold. I ain't claiming it. I'm not speaking it. But if somebody shoots you in your chest, you can't say, I ain't claiming this bullet. No, I've been shot. I got a bullet inside of me and somebody hurry up and get me to the hospital or give me a pair of tweezers. I'm going to go in here and get it out by faith. But I'm going to deal with the existential realities of life because God doesn't dismiss them. So why should I?